we had very minimal of the effects season one. I mean, that was probably the biggest difference. There's definitely a difference of scale between season one and season two. Season two was more action. We had a hundred times more effects than we did in season one. You know, it just evolves and it just gets bigger. So we went into season two knowing that visual effects were going to be utilized not just to augment practical effects, but really to create things that are not humanoid. The key is just bringing in a top-notch visual effects team. They felt like it's going to get bigger season two than season one in terms of visual effects. And there were like the two things, the, the shadow monster and the demogorgons. Those were the two things that we knew right from the get-go that the, there had to be developed and figured out. And that was something we didn't have year one, where we had visual effects team on the ground with us at all times, making sure we were getting everything we needed to make it look as good as possible. Just to make it on par with the first season would have been great, but I think we shot for the moon, and I think it's uh, it shows in season two. <laughs> Basically, the way that Stranger Things works is that the Duffers write something down that's in their head. Every other department gets to say, oh, we can do this, we can do this, and we can do this. There's all kinds of department that can do things. And when they run out of people who say they can do this, then it's my job to say, we can do this no matter what it is. Second season, before we were even in pre-production, I was having phone meetings with Paul and Christina Graff. We're always involved with VFX from the very beginning because we need to know exactly where our world stops and their world starts. Season two, we knew coming in it was going to be a giant undertaking and they brought the visual effects department in with editorial. When we did season one, Initially, the approach was to do everything 95% practical. We realized that, in fact, the vision that the brothers had was more extensive than one can always do practically. So the Groffs really came to this show. They dug deep, and the quality of the work they produced, the photorealism, was, I think, incredibly, incredibly impressive. We have to design a lot of the environments and the creatures. He had already so many interesting ideas. How do we pull off this shadow monster and how do we pull off Dart, this small creature? And then they brought in Michael Marr, who is yes. now our storyboard artist and concept artist. If I'm storyboarding a scene, it's usually heavier on visual effects or complicated stunt work. So the storyboards more or less become the Bible for that. We pretty much just shoot his storyboards. I'm not advocating well for my directing. And of course there's concept design showing how the rift is going to look. A lot of the effects were driven by the concept art. And then he also, he he helps us figure out the monster designs. It starts usually with a, a sculpture, so we digitally sculpt things, um, almost as if you were to do it with clay. The four stages of the Demogorgon evolution and the shadow monster were what we started with. We went through a process of design. There was like a polywalk stage, and then it would uh, develop extremities, and then it would grow and eat the cat, and then it would grow really large to the size of a large dog. The tricky part about shooting something that's invisible is it's invisible and it's really hard for the actors to know where to look and what it looks like. We would give them something, if possible, to perform with. What we had were silicone gels, so there's weight and they, there's an eye line and they can interact with them. They'll have like a marble or something in your hand or something that's replacing what you're actually looking at. It was really nice for the actors to have something to engage with. The climax for the Demogorgons is really the death of Bob, where he gets like attacked. So we figured even if it's harder to sort of like erase somebody from the frame, we need some kind of person in the shot that really fights with him and really like lays into him. Paul also designed that closing shot of the shadow monster above the school. We wrote that camera's gonna rotate and, the, and then as we're rotating, it's gonna become the upside down. And Paul took it literally. What if we go underneath the ground? And that's not even something I thought we could do. I was like, well, that would be cool. If we could do it, how could we do it? And he's like, I don't know, I'm gonna figure it out. We had to basically face the camera forward, go up, then go down to a 90 degree rotation, then pull the technocrane back another 30 feet, put the camera back down and do the exact same speed, opposite direction, and then flop one of those two shots. You know, and he figured it out, and then Michael drew it so that everybody could see it. And then it feels like it's rotating at the same speed. It sounds easy. It's really difficult to do for the camera operators. We had like about five people on wheels on a camera trying to get this Technocrane to I think Bob said he have never seen so many people operating a Technocrane at the same time. But they got, I mean, they, they were all incredible and they got it. 
we think about composition and camera angles and lighting. So it all kind of uh, blends together into what could be best for the story, what's going to give the most impact emotionally, what could really make a fun and exciting shot. The thing about a show like this, it is so much work that you, you have to rely on people. So you need smart, creative, passionate people like Paul and Christina.